The prior episode sparked some interesting discussions around people code and design patterns. Great, great comments, and thank you so much for engaging with us as a community. So we named that episode, the prior episode, People Code Design Patterns, thinking of patterns as a reoccurring theme or, say, a model, a solution applied to many situations. But I do need to be careful when using the phrase design patterns. As one viewer rightly noted, there exists quite a list of known programming design patterns, and <laughs> I didn't mention a single pattern on that list. Well, here I go again. In this episode, I want to talk about a recurring theme I see in people code. And yes, for lack of a better term, let's call it a pattern. I've heard it referred to, this pattern, I've heard it referred to as the app class controller. Here, let me explain. On my screen, I have a component showing training courses. And when those courses are offered, we might say course sessions. This is a component our students create in our People Tools 1 class. In fact, this is the same component we used in the prior episode. Now, in our People Code class, we have students implement business logic, such as ensuring that the start date precedes the end date, or that the prerequisite course code is disabled when the checkbox is not checked. Come to think of it, we mentioned that in our prior episode as well. And given People Code's history of being event-based procedural code, as you can imagine, the code describing this component's business logic is housed in component events. So here's what we're seeing. Developers are moving logic out of event handlers into application classes. Now, this doesn't eliminate event people code, but rather consolidates most component people code into a single listing. And that's one of the first reasons I've heard for people choosing the component controller is to get all code into a single code listing. Now, I've heard these app classes referred to as controllers, but they're really not. And I'm going to explain why in great detail, but first, for those that are new to this pattern, let me demonstrate. Let's create a new app class in a package, the package named TRN for training or module. And let's name this class after, first after the component, and then suffix it with event handler. So here, let's give it the name, TRN, C-R-S-E, S-E-S, the name of our component, and suffix with event handler. That's kind of an ugly name, isn't it? But I like having the tar target object in the name, and I like saying that it is an event handler. I think that makes it more clear what it is and why we have it. Okay, now in our code editor, let's of course declare a class. Oh, you know, I really don't want to type that whole name again. Here, let me show you a quick little trick. Let's name it X. I mean, we could name it anything we want to, but uh, for now, let's call it X. And then, of course, end class. Now, the little trick is when I save or validate my code, PeopleSoft is going to rename the class to match the code editor. Now, we do have to be careful with this little trick. We have to ensure that we apply it before creating a constructor, for example. Well, of course, that is if we need a constructor. Now, in a moment, we're going to start moving code from the component into this application class. But before we do that, let's think about where would we use this in the class? I mean, if we think about the class, well, an application, where would we use this in the component? And if we think about a class, one of the benefits of a class over, say, function-based or procedural code is that classes are stateful. Uh, meaning they can retain state between method invocations. So if we think about a component, we think about the different events and this being an event handler, uh, I think we want a component scoped variable. And I think it should exist or be initialized within, say, the first event trigger within the component scope. That would be pre-built. So let's do this. I'm going to copy the component or the class name so I don't have to retype it. And then let's go to our component people code. So let's see, view people code and pre-builds here. Let's import our class first. And the oh, TRN. And then let's declare a variable. Let's just call it handler. 
and then let's create our instance. All right, let's validate, save. Hey, if it compiles, it must work, right? <laughs> Not really. We probably should test at this point before going any further just to make sure that it all works. But hey, there's hardly any code here, so let's just assume that it works. So we'll check it out later. OK, now let's start moving some of that code. So let's start with the prerequisite check field. I see the code here. Let's keep it here for a minute. And let's go back to the event handler. And let's now declare a method. Uh, let's see. Let's name this method after the object to which it refers prerequisite check. So method prerequisite check underscore field change. And let's see down here. Oh, you know what? We need our parens, don't we? And semicolon. And then method prerequisite check field change and method. And we'll paste in our code, save it, make sure it compiles. And here, let's, let's go back to our field change now. And of course, we need the same objects. Oops, actually, we need these top two lines here for our import and our scope. And then we just need to invoke the handler. Prerequisite check field change. Perfect. OK, let's see. Now let's copy this, because if we go up here to the records row in it, well, you know, it actually looks like it implements the exact same code. So let's drop that. We don't need that anymore. And hmm, you know, we could actually just invoke that same event again, couldn't we? I don't know. Uh, something about that. I don't like that. Let's do this. I mean, for one thing, we might want to change the code. So let's name it this. Now, this method doesn't exist yet, so let's go ahead and define it. And then the method is going to have the exact same code, but oh, wait. What do you think about that? If it had the exact same code, that doesn't sound like a good idea. One of our best practices is to implement the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. And one way that we avoid repeating ourselves is refactoring redundant code into a shared definition. With procedural code, that would have been a function library, and then we would have imported that function library or declared that function library for use within all of the different events. One of the key benefits of this app class controller pattern is that we now it's easier to see, hey, where's that redundant code? And then we have all of that code here in listings to make it easier to refactor to see and use right here, rather than having it scattered across a variety of function libraries. So let's declare it as a private member here. And let's see, what should we name it? How about set prereq code state? You know, state as in enable disabled. I like that. And then, oops, let's go ahead and add in our end method. And then we'll move the code from the prior code into our shared method. And then, of course, replace it. Looking good so far. Let's call it in here as well. Save. Oh, let's see. We did something wrong. Set prerequisite code state is not a method of this class. Oh, forgot an E there, didn't I? Perfect. Hey, I like it. It compiles. Great. OK, back to the component. Let's see. We've got row in it there. Let's save this. Looks like it should work, right? Let's test it out. OK, let's see. Let's try the prerequisite course code. Oh, do you see that data integrity error? This is another reason I hear people cite for using the app class controller. See, this data integrity error, what it's telling us is, hey, you change the code in the component, and we need to reload the component to reinitialize, reset, start over. Uh, I kind of think of it like 
changing the oil in a vehicle while it's still running. I mean, would you do that? No, not today. But should you be able to? Whoa, I mean, imagine. I mean, think of it today. We have hot swappable power supplies in our servers. We have hot swappable CPUs. I mean, everything. We're going with hot swapping. So why not hot swapping code? Hmm. I don't know. Interesting. Anyways, if you take the code out of the component and move it into an app class, then the people code component processor doesn't know the code has changed. So you can change it in process while, so to speak, the engine is running. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, okay, so let's search. Let's test it out. Uh, let's see. People code one class. Let's try this. That works awesome. Previous enlist. Oh, let's not save. Oh, look at that. It's disabled when it's not checked. It's enabled when it's checked. Perfect. It appears to be working. Okay. Now, we have a lot of cleanup to do, but first let's talk about what this pattern is and isn't, what it does and doesn't do. First, I've heard this referred to as the component or app class controller. I think the idea comes from the model view controller pattern. I mean, if we think about it, we have a model, that's our component buffer. We have a view, that is our page, but what about the controller in the MVC pattern? Could we use an app class for the controller? Well, the answer of course is always yes, but a better question is, do we want to? You see, we already have a controller. It is the component processor. The component processor loads data, it identifies relationships, performs basic validation, prepares pages, controls flow between pages and events, handles tra transactions, and so much more. I mean, even if we could, well, do we really want to replicate all of that in an application class? So why do this? Why implement this pattern at all? Great question, and I've heard many reasons. For example, and I mentioned a lot of them as we went along. One reason is to see all comment code. <laughs> one reason is to see all component code in one place. And really, I can appreciate that, but I have a comprehension capacity of about one page. If I have to scroll, I'm going to get lost. For me, I actually don't want to see all the code in one place. I want to see it in context only. Another reason I've heard for this pattern is reuse, but you know, I question that. I mean, as customers, we build one-off specialized solutions. How much reuse do we really have? How much do we really get? Now, as we saw here, there is a reuse benefit, even in the simple example. We combined row init and field change so we can make a case for reuse. Another theory is that the app class controller could replace a component interface giving us reuse in App Engine or, say, Integration Broker. That would be so cool, but our app class classes don't load data or manage transactions. They'd have to do so much more. So again, I ask, is there value in this pattern? Yes, but where? In writing testable code. Discrete methods of an app class properly written without context awareness may be tested individually outside of a component. That isn't possible with basic event code. Here, let's refactor our code to be properly testable, uh, for that matter, even reusable. Uh, for it to be reusable and testable, our code must not be context aware. For example, the component buffer references like we have here, they need to be replaced with, say, variables passed in uh, to the functions or methods. So let's see, local boolean, like here, right here. Let's replace this. Let's replace it with a variable. Let's call it session, because that's what it represents, right? The core session. And same thing right here. And of course, now that we're not using component state, we need to properly reference value. And this method now requires a parameter. Let's call it in session as record fields being the default property for a record, or should I say get field being the default method for a record, allowing us to use the shorthand reference, making it look more like these are properties of an object, which I think by itself makes it very clear, which kind of brings up the point of Hungarian notation, which we see a lot of people recommend, but I don't know. I mean, I don't really want to see this as a record, even though it is. I think it reads better if we think of it as an object session as record. And then let's see, because we have it here, we need to pass it as a parameter here, but it needs to become a parameter 
to these other outer methods, don't they? The external interface, so to speak, of the application class. Let's save this. Looks good. Context aware functions such as get row set are perfect for components, but limit method reuse. Anyway, I want to talk more about writing testable code, but let's save that for another episode. Personally, I think this is a great pattern, but to properly implement it, I think we need to understand the why behind it. And controllers is not that why. Now, I think we need a name for this pattern. I mean, what does it do? Well, from a component event, we delegate to an app class method, sort of like when we pass off a task to a peer or a subordinate, which that's considered delegating. You know, I'd really love to call this the delegate pattern, but that name is already taken. I don't know. What about the handler pattern? What do you think? Share your ideas with us in the comment section below. Now, the content in this video is a subset of our people code material. Are you interested in learning more? Check out our website to see what we're offering next. Or, here's an idea. Subscribe to our LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter feeds to receive updates every time we post a course. Or, even better, give us a call and let us help you develop a people tools training strategy. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe for more content. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.